Hi. Well, we're going to continue our um, investigation, our phenomenological investigation of uh, the nature of our experience or the nature of our reality as experiencing beings. And we're going to continue with uh, the idea we were working with last time, the idea of being in, being in the world in Der Weltsein uh, that we got from Heidegger's book, Being in Time. Uh, this time around, is, uh, uh, what I want to focus on a little bit is the question, who are you or who am I? The who. Uh, and to do that, we're going to begin uh, where we left off last time by looking at the nature of things. Um, but also last time we were looking at a couple of uh, images. And to get started, uh, I want to just um, uh, remind you of, of the images we looked at. We, we looked at... Um, the, the uh, Manet painting of the uh, server at the Folie Bergère. And I wanted to, to um, I want you to look at another one, one that I talk about quite a bit in Sites of Exposure, that, that is uh, similar, somewhat similar in the way it works, and that is uh, a painting often called Las Meninas uh, by Diego Velázquez. And the thing, the thing that's striking about these works is that in each case, whether it's the... Um, uh, f the server at the at the at the bar, uh, or whether it's the painter uh, in the um, house in the palace of of uh, Philip, uh, King Philip of Spain. In either case, um, th that person is looking at you, and th so these these paintings draw the draw your attention to the fact that you are looking at them. It's almost like they say, "I know you're looking at me." Um, so what what they do is they draw your attention to the fact that what you are seeing is your perspective. Um, so th these paintings really stand out because they uh, because their very uh, character is to single you out like that. But um, but basically any we could say the same thing about any realistic painting, right? The if you look at um, this painting I really like uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, Frederick uh, Edwin Church's painting, The Heart of the Andes. Um, this, you know, it's a painting of, of uh, mountains and trees and clouds and so on in, in the mountains in South America. Um, it's obviously, you know, a realistic painting of a natural landscape. But uh, so it's not it's not somebody it's somebody's eyes staring at you. It's, it's just nature, and it's kind of indifferent, you know, to to you. But the thing that's interesting is that uh, this is also your perspective, right? You, this is this is the mountain and that valley as seen from a certain a certain spot, a certain person's position. Uh, th this is what this would look like to someone. Um, and you know, if you were standing in a different position, it would look different. So one of the things that's interesting about those, the um, Manet painting and the Las Meninas painting is that, you know, those paintings kind of say, notice, this is your perspective. Well, this painting, the, the, the church painting of the Heart of the Andes, doesn't, doesn't so much say that, but it remains nonetheless true. Right? On the one hand, you could say, yes, this is a painting of a mountain. But on the other hand, you'd have, you, if you're going to be accurate, you have to say, this is the painting of a perspective. So this image just as much portrays an act of experiencing and a, and a, a particular experience of subjectivity as it does portray a, a certain objective state of affairs. Um, now, let me read uh, um, uh, something from Sites of Exposure about that point. Right, so this is from page 18. Uh, so, so it's going to say the same thing uh, that I just said, but I just want you to, to hear it in the words of the book. Uh, so page 18, the, the paragraph that begins halfway down the page. Um, in addition, then, to teaching us to distinguish being a subject from being an object, Las Meninas also alerts us to something about our own perceiving. In considering an appearance, one is always considering an appearance to someone or an appearance for someone. We can thus describe the determinate features of the appearance, it, its objective features, so to, speak, so to speak. But we can also describe the perspective for which it is an appearance. Uh, 
right? We can describe the stance of subjectivity that's implied in such an appearing. So we could do this with a, with a portrait of a person. We can do it with the picture of the mountain and so on. Uh, it's both a portrayal of the mountain and it is the portrayal of a point of view, right? Now here's the point. And we can equally do that with respect to what appears to us in our ongoing experience. That's the crucial point. So in the same way that from a um, painted appearance, you can re you can ask, what is the stance of subjectivity that's being portrayed here? What, it, what uh, we can read back from how it appears to to the perspective to which it is appearing. Well, that's equally true of the way things appear in your ongoing experience. You don't have to go to a painting for that. So in any situation you're in, something is appearing. And it's appearing in a particular way. And we can, we can describe how it's appearing. And in so doing, we're describing actually a perspective. Right? We can ask, who are you such that reality appears to you this way? So we will read back subjectivity from how things appear. Now I'm going to say more about that in a minute, but I want to read two more quotations. One more from Sites of Exposure. I'll, read, I'll just read them quickly, and, and then one from Being in Time, and then I'll describe or explain them. But this one's from the bottom of page 20, uh, the last two lines. Uh, the ongoing fact of my experience only is the experience of all the many determinacies that constitute the world beyond me. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll say something about that before I read the Heidegger, right? So the point is, and I think I said this last time around, like you, you, you were born and you started experiencing, and that's what's been going on ever since. It's never stopped, and you've never done anything else. There, there isn't any other little room you can go inhabit where you shut down experiencing for a while and you just are yourself, right? You, experiencing is always happening. Appearing is always happening. Being appeared to is always happening. Um, so the whole history of you, 100% of what you have been is that history of determinate appearings. Right? Who, who are you or what have you been? You have been. The, I'll use the, the word seeing, but of course there's much more than seeing going on. But you have been the seeing of this and then the seeing of this and then the seeing of this and then the seeing of this, right? You as a subject just are that whole history of determinate appearings. Right? So read that sentence again. The ongoing fact of my experience only is the experience of all the many determinacies that constitute that world beyond me. Right? Uh, let me read the Heidegger quotation. This is uh, from a little farther ahead in the book than where we were reading. We were reading around page 100 last time. Uh, this is from page 171 in our uh, translation, Macquarie and Robinson. Uh, uh, but the point, but he's still talking about a lot of the same stuff. And, and I just want to read this sentence, which I think is quite helpful. He says, The entity which is essentially constituted by being in the world is itself, in every case, it's there. So Dasein, his, his language for what we are, Dasein is its there. Um, uh, seems to me that says much the same thing as the thing I just said based on that quotation from Sites of Exposure. So I'm just going to go uh, and... Uh, elaborate on that a bit, explain that a bit. Um, uh, we, I was saying before about your, you know, the painting, you can read back a perspective from, from the painting. And then I'm saying, you know, in, in, in appearance in general, you can read back from how things appear to you to, to figure out, like, who am I? Who am I such that things appear to me in this way? Um, well, um, uh, As I said last time, and as I alluded to quickly a minute ago, uh, appearing is much more than than visual display, right? A lot more goes on in appearing. A lot more goes on in, in experiencing than just uh, visual stimulation, right? Uh, of, of course, there's also sound and all the rest, but but the, but there's so much more, right? There's there's um, a affective engagement, right? Your whole sort of emotional life, um, and there is uh, practical interaction, right? Be behavioral involvement. Um, uh, we could probably say more things too, but but that's enough. I mean, I really want you just to be thinking about that way that we inhabit a situation, right? That was the big point I was trying to make last time about being being in that um, picking up on Heidegger's remark about inhabitation or dwelling, 
right? The, the, to experience at its root is to inhabit, right? It's not to see an object. It's to live in a situation with all the richness that that involves, right? And that's the really rich, uh, robust, thick conception of experience that Heidegger is, is trying to get us to focus on. And that kind of experience is, is, um, is intelligent. Right? I was talking last time, I think, about the discriminating character of our behavior, even though it's unreflective. Right? So there's, there's understanding um, manifest in our behavior all the time. Um, uh, Heidegger was giving the example of the workman with his hammer or, or something like that right and, and so you know even though you're talking to your friend when you're hammering you know the the way you interact with the world reflects your knowledge your know-how right your 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 understanding not necessarily at a reflective cognitive level but at the level of your engagement right it it, it, it reflects your understanding of what the situation is and how it works let's, let's just stick with that example for a second right in the workshop um a, a, you know, I think of my little son, who's uh, four years old now. If if I had a workshop like a carpenter or something like that, if my son walked into it, he would, uh, if he weren't bored, he'd be excited. I mean, you know, he might be bored and just not notice it and want to go play with his toys. But if he did notice it, he wouldn't think of it the way I do as a carpenter. He would think, oh, look at those cool things. Look at those interesting things, right? And so he might find it um, a, sort of a magical thing, right? Or um, if uh, somebody else uh, was in a, was trying to prop a door open, they might think, where can I find something? And they might look at, you know, a, a nice high quality, you know, plane I have to do my some kind of fine carpentry work. Uh, and they might think, oh, I can use that to prop the door open and go grab it and not experience it as a plane, but as experience, experience it as a potential doorstop. Um, uh, so my point there is that when I'm, inhabiting that perspective as a carpenter when i'm inhabiting that situation as a carpenter i have a perspective uh it to be a carpenter isn't isn't just an objective feature about some kind of thing that exists in the world it is a perspective it's a way to have things appear to you and and to the perspective of the carpenter is the one within which these tools rise to the surface and experience as the ready equipment when they are needed you know um, uh, and so uh, they uh, when I'm inhabiting that situation as a carpenter the the whole situation appears to me quite differently from the way it appears to my son when he goes in and thinks oh look at this magical little place or to whoever it is who thinks, oh, I need a doorstop and grabs an expensive plane and just puts it down on the ground to hold the door open. Um, um, uh, in each case, you know, my son might have seen that plane, the person grabbing it might might see it, or I might pick it up to use it. In each case, in, in a certain sense, you would say the same thing was there. But but even if we accept that description as correct, that, that thing appeared in quite radically different ways in those three cases, right? And so the how of its appearing is a reflection of who you are, right? Basically how you're taking it up, how, how you're open to seeing what the world could be or what the world might be. Um, uh, so, um, so, uh, Furthermore, if I am a carpenter, you know, we use that word, that, I can use that word am in a kind of a strong sense. You know, in the, in the Republic, um, Socrates is, is talking with uh, Plato's brothers, Glaucon and uh, Adamantus, about, you know, how, how, where cities come from and how, how, what would make a city just. And they're, they're, they're talking about, you know, what, what is, you know, what goes into a city. And basically, the, the idea is, it's got to be a division of labor, you know. People, different people, have to do different things. There got to, it's got to be a, somebody who gets food. There's got to be a shoemaker. There's got to be a this and a that, you know. And they kind of build up a city out of a number of activities that people engage in. And and part of the point there is, you know, quite a good point is that um, we live in a world of highly dem, uh, differentiated uh, economic functioning, and different people 
you know slot themselves into different different roles in that functioning economic system so nobody does it all we all do you know this thing we all do this piece or that that piece of the large game of how the economic system of the society as a whole works and uh, and pretty much any person is going to do one thing every now and then somebody does two things every now and then somebody does no meaningful things but usually you're going to do one thing you're either a store clerk or you're a nurse or you're a teacher or you're a truck driver uh, or uh, you know you're a lawyer right but but you, you know you end up you end up picking basically your thing that you do um, and and that actually in a significant way becomes your life right I mean you have other things too uh, you, you know you have your friends and you do stuff beyond that but the thing the thing I want to get at is that that job you take on isn't just a, a you know a one-off thing it's it's the thing you do day after day and it becomes uh, uh, a kind of defining feature of who you are such that you will say to people I am a lawyer if, if you're a lawyer um, uh, uh, so when I'm talking about the perspective of the carpenter or whatever you know whichever one we're gonna pick the, the thing I also want you to think about is that when I say that how, how the, the way the situation appears is sort of reflecting who you are generally speaking that's also not just an instantaneous or momentary thing right in a significant way it's also uh, for those things that are the, the important things we do it's really reflecting how, how we have made a home in the world going back to that notion of inhabitation you know the 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 things we do in the in the in the in that deep sense of the our defining activities our life activities are are ways of making a kind of inhabitation in the world. Uh, and so in that sense, it's not surprising that they reflect us, right? How the world um, appears to us is the flip side of how we have come to make sense of ourselves as, as participants in the world. Um, and so that means... Um, who we are as experiencing subjects is sort of both embodied in and reflected in things as they appear to us. Um, let me uh, um, just quickly look at a couple more examples just to think about that. There's a this is the there's a famous altarpiece. Uh, uh, it's called the Marode altarpiece by the workshop of uh, Robert Campan. Um, and I want to just look at the uh, at the right panel of that. It, I'm not going to study it in any deep artistic sense, but you know the right panel has this guy who's working in. And I just want you, you know, it's got these great pictures of uh, this guy and his tools. Um, so there you there you have the very kind of person I've been talking about. And uh, I don't think this particular this painting particularly puts on display the thing I'm talking about. But based on what I've been saying, you can sort of see it in relationship to this image but you can see how that guy would actually kind of feel at home in his tools and in an interesting way if you if you took the the organic body out of there and just did, took a picture of the the tools there that are sitting on the table in a sense you could say that's a portrait of him uh, and and you know he he might even recognize this as a portrait of him right you might see that and think oh yeah that's that's my life um, this is a painting of by Van Gogh, Van Gogh, of um, some shoes, and and I guess what I want you to think of here is, you know, if you remember, uh, if, actually, let's go back for a second to that Jeff Wall, the the view from an apartment, and I, I talked a fair bit about the woman who's sitting on the couch, just sort of slumped there, right, not really paying attention to anything, but you know, think about what it's like to feel at home there. Um, you know, if that really were a home, it probably is, you know, just some staged thing I don't know the story of how Jeff Wall made that picture but presumably it's staged but let's just say it really is someone's apartment well then that person who's sitting there has probably sat on that couch or futon whatever it is uh, you know 496 times or, or more likely you know 2950 times um, and she's used to those cushions um, she's used to the stuff all around her you know the the 
she feels at home there because all of that stuff kind of reflects her. And as I said yesterday, like even it, you might think it's a bit messy, but that's that's kind of how people live their houses because they have things uh, kind of in in the form that's relevant to their lives. Um, and so, again, if you think of these shoes, it's interesting that they don't look new by any means. And yet if you think of shoes of your own that you use a lot, you, uh, at least a lot of people are quite happy. Like they think, oh, this is my favorite pair of shoes. And they're quite happy to um, keep wearing their old worn out Blundstones or their Doc Martens or uh, whatever kind of shoes they are. Um, well, what are those um, running shoes called? Chuck, uh, Chuck Taylors? Is that what it is? Um, Anyway, whatever, whatever they're called, um, or vans. You know, you you have your you have your ones that you've used for um, maybe a few years, and they may be worn, they may be writ, they may have stains on them, and yet you love to put them on because um, you really feel at home in them. And you might like new shoes too; that's great. And at some point, you might throw out shoes when they really get too worn out. But the thing that's interesting is, I think for most people, you got to go pretty far down that path for things to be worn out. And the, the, you know, the point at which you would keep wearing shoes, I say you, I mean the average person, the point at which the average person would keep wearing shoes uh, before throwing them out and think, yeah, these are still good and usable is well past the point that generally they would be able to be sold in a store. Uh, you know, nobody else would want them. Anybody else would look at them and think those are worn out. But your own shoes, even when they're in that state, can often be, you know, quite uh, welcome, quite quite familiar. And it's shoes, it could also be, a, you know, a shirt, a pair of pants, something like that, hat, coat. Um, uh, so the thing that I'm, I'm trying to get at there is that um, the things, the tools of the, of the uh, woodworking guy in the mirrored altarpiece, or the shoes in the Van Gogh painting, uh, um, there, those are things that probably are more or less like the equipment that Heidegger, for, for those people, for the person wearing the shoes and for the guy working on wood, the carpenter, um, those things are pretty much like the equipment that Heidegger talked about last week. Uh, they're things that, uh, they're, they're, they're the things we turn to to allow us to carry out our tasks. And in that sense, they are, they are not objects, right? They are not things present at hand that we stare at and think, oh, there's an alien thing. They are the very medium in and through which we carry out our own identities. And so those things, the, 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 the way they appear in our experience is reflective of how we are inhabiting a world, of who we are. And the interesting thing is they don't appear as visual objects. They, they appear uh, generally as inconspicuous hidden realities that are not even noticed by the person using them, right? They, their appearing is such that they disappear. They, they appear as what, what falls out of explicit perception to allow something else to appear right you know again the words that the woman was reading in the magazine obviously she has a visual experience of them and yet they don't appear as words as such they they the the words on the page that she has a visual relationship to uh, recede in her experience so that the things they're expressing can appear to her right so it's interesting then that these 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 things that constitute the very fabric of our active engagement with the world, or our equipment, as Heidegger says, appears, but it it appears as the the rich determinate structure of readiness that is that is available to allow us to carry out our tasks, and so it it appears as. Uh, uh, inconspicuously it appears in such a way that we don't notice it it appears sort of disappearingly um, uh, so um, okay so that you know I'm, I'm just I'm trying to just to uh, just push a little deeper into this idea that um, 
what appears the the the, the thingly sort of side of things is at the same time the appearing of ourselves that the the who i am and the what it is uh, appear together uh, which is another way of, of or which is a way of explaining what what heidegger means when he says dasein is it's there right the the reality into which you are thrown isn't isn't some alien thing uh, it is the very substance and fabric of who you are and and you know you're not thrown into neutral and indifferent objects you're thrown meaningfully into a setting and a, into a situation where the very uh, identities of the things that make up that that situation is reflective of your perspective of of how you are relating to things of how you are open to things you know going back again to the carpenter me as a carpenter my son and the person who uses the plane as a doorstop the putatively the same thing the plane uh is is really seen as three different things by those three different people um okay uh so um um that's that's more or less the point I wanted to make here. I want to wrap it up with one one uh, one last little thing, and then we'll we'll stop, and then we'll come back and push a little farther. Um, so then, I, so I, I wanted you to just think about things. Like, let's go back to that um, uh, uh, the right panel of the Marold altarpiece. Um, you know, if you if you could look at those tools, you know, and you could say who. Who is implied in this you know so we were saying before that you know you can read back who someone is from the way things appear to them well we're not really qu exactly seeing how those tools appear to that guy that's not an image of it's appearing to him but but nonetheless sometimes we can just we can start with if you know if, if you could uh, i wish i had a picture of this i actually looked for one i couldn't find it i really wish i had one i wish i could get a picture of the carpenter's workshop when the carpenter's not there but so you would see the tools kind of strewn around on the desk, like you see the magazines and the socks and the lawn, you know whatever else strewn around in the apartment in that Jeff Wall image. You know if you went to the to the carpenter's workshop, and the carpenter's not there, but you see these things, right? And you can sort of you could say, what is the subjectivity that is implied in this setting? Um, you know, and that that stuff speaks to competent hands uh it, it's it speaks to uh you know really um fine bodily engagement with things it's very bodily but it's not like uh mountain climbing you know it's it's doing fine work with things uh and you know making subtle distinctions um it's um it speaks of learning it speaks to someone who has a highly developed um, engagement with wood, engagement with products, engagement with how you get from here to there, and so on. Um, it speaks to someone, you know, if you if if you if you imagine that this is on a desk that's um, thir thirty four inches high, and the stuff is spread out about this much, then you're saying, well, it, it speaks to a person who's about six feet tall who can stand up on two legs and who has two arms that can reach around at about this size right it, it speaks to the parameters of the of the organic body of that person as well and you know in, in particular like it's it's it, it, it the, that workshop i just described wouldn't be a workshop for someone uh who was in a wheelchair who or who had you know who had legs amputated then would have to deal with things at a lower level or wouldn't speak to someone missing an arm um you know the, so there of course there could be carpenters with with those characteristics but then th that person's workshop their workshop would be laid out somewhat differently right so so it's both the case that the particular items the tools and so on announce something about who you are but also you know one one step more generally um how they are positioned spatially um, speaks to something about what kind of mobility you have, right? Uh, um, what kind of 
bodily space you take up and what kind of bodily actions are are open to you so i want to I'll, I'll stop this here but that with this is the first point i want to make about this issue of reading back to who we are from the way things appear um, i wanted to just explore essentially the tools of the workman roughly that heidegger had been describing in section when he talked about equipment in section 15 i wanted to explore that a little bit more and, and think about how we would go back from tools uh, and, and so on um, and and uh, um, I'm going to read one more short quotation uh, just then to get us to think about uh, things and um, this is again from sites of exposure it's on page 31 it starts on line 14 uh, because I want you now to um, just to sort of sum up the thing I've been saying so far uh, we, we talked about things last time, and I was carrying on talking about things this time. And the, the, what I'm really trying to get at then is that, that in things, as they appear to us, our meaningful ways of inhabiting the world are articulated. And therefore, th um, how things appear... Uh, reflects that that uh, way of inhabiting the world and so we really understand things when we grasp them as uh, the uh, sentences and paragraphs sort of defining our life right they 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 sort of the, the grammar and the vocabulary of our life right um, uh, and so things not not as um, neutral objects but as experienced reality that show themselves to us in a particular way things understood in that way uh, become uh, that from which we can read back who we are right and so I'm just going to read you this one sentence from page 31 uh, line 14 it says I say here um, the thing then will not be understood when it is taken in abstraction from its role in articulating the lives of persons. Um, there's more to that sentence. I'm not going to read the further part of it, although it's, when you read the book, you'll see the importance of the other side. But I just wanted to bring out that, that aspect, right? That the very reality of things, precisely because our experience is a matter of being in, of inhabitation, because of that, the very reality of things is that they are the determinate ways that our lives are articulated. Um, and so that's that's what we want to pick up on. Um, so I was sort of using the, the carpenter's tools as a way into thinking about that. And, uh, you know, the shoes and the, the living room setting in the Jeff Wall picture and so on. I want to take a break there and then come back next time and look at a few more specific things and in order to ask, okay, what do these things tell us about who we are?